Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, and we'll start reading in verse number 10. As we therefore, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand? As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them in mercy and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that if we have any pride in us swelling up this morning, that we humble ourselves and lay it at the foot of the cross. That if there be anything good in us that we recognize that which we have good in us is because you put it there. I pray that the boastful people we are in this world, that we'll recalibrate, that we'll be called to refocus and recognize that the only thing that matters in this life is boasting about what your son did on Calvary's hill. I pray that we brag on your love I pray that we lift you up. And the Lord, we pray that this morning you'll be with the Greens in this hard time, Lord, as they deal with the loss of their mother. We pray for your comfort, for your grace, for your strength to be lavishly poured out upon them, Lord. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. It was during Paul's second missionary journey that he would arrive in the area of Asia Minor and God would move upon the scene and as he was working there in Asia Minor, Paul would be preaching God's word. He would be heralding the truth of the gospel and as the gospel was being preached, churches would be started, lives would be changed, families would be restored and by the way, that's still what the gospel does today. Even here in 2024, you can count on this. Wherever the name of Jesus Christ is lifted up, lives will be changed and churches will be started. He is still in the saving business. But in the midst of this glorious time, in the midst of this great movement, what it would seem that throughout this part of Asia Minor, revival had struck. And you can really see the emphasis in chapter 1 when he says, unto the churches of Galatia. God was so mightily moving in this area that not one church was started, but many churches were started because God was mightily moving on the scene, but understand this, that though the, in those first few verses we rejoice at the thought that God is on the scene, in those few first few verses we rejoice that God is saving people, we understand that anytime there is forward momentum in ministry, anytime new ground is gained for the cause of Jesus Christ, Satan will arrive on the scene and seek to hinder the Lord's work. Anytime you attempt to make progress, problems will arrive. Here in the book of Galatians, 
That is exactly what happened in the midst of what I will call a revival in the area of Asia. It was during this time that we know the story that the Judaizers had slept, slipped into the church. And as they sl slipped into the church, they began to they began to manipulate the gospel. They began to add to the gospel. Understand, though, what they did is that they didn't come into this area of Asia. They didn't come into Galatia and say that Jesus was nothing. They came on the scene and said that you need Jesus, but then they added an additional factor. You need Jesus plus the Mosaic law. You need Jesus plus circumcision. You need Jesus plus this act and in all of this they never sought to discredit who Jesus was but they they added that he wasn't enough by the way when someone is trying to push their own agenda don't be surprised that this is what happens not only did they add to the gospel that Paul preached but when Paul rebuked them. They began to discredit Paul's credentials. They began to discredit Paul's apostolic authority. And when you sit back and watch and they say, uh, when you see people who rebuke people's motives, when you see people who rebuke people's agendas before long, sit back and watch and you'll see they began to, they will begin to discredit the person who tried to give them truth. This is not a Jew, just a Judaizer problem. This is a, a mankind problem. And the root of this problem is anchored in pride. Here now the gospel had been derailed. They had undermined God's man in order to look important. Yesterday I talked about this in the Sunday school hour. Yesterday I, I had the opportunity with my wife to help minister at the Christian Workers Conference in Quincy, Kentucky. And you know what? While we sat there and fellowshiped and shared and I heard the burdens of other members and other pastors, not one of them raised their hand and said, listen, Brother Holt, pray for me. I'm having problems with Judaizers. But let me tell you what I did here while I was sitting there people began to request prayer because they had people in the house of God who had made church about them they had made their singing about them they had made their opinions about them when they arrived in the church it was their own divisive way you hear me they stood up when the pastor stood up against this matter what happened amongst these people they began to undermine the pastor himself they began to say hey you know what he's not even a very good preacher hey you know what we're starving to death and as I began to listen Listen to the things that was happening to this brother. I was reminded of this very text. The reality is that though we do not have Judaizers today, the reality is that even amongst God's people, we have people who arrive in the house of God and try to make church all about them. This is a troubling time for the churches in Galatia, and it's a troubling time for churches in our nation. Though in the first few verses of chapter 1, it seems that Paul starts off rejoicing unto the churches of Galatia. The statement alone is that God is moving. But by the time he makes it to the sixth verse, he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He marveled that these people who, who had been mightily saved, who, who God had moved in their life and, and had turned away from the old life, had soon, so soon been drawn back to the old life. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace. He removed in chapter 2, as this emotion began to well up in him, that these people had fallen away from the truth of the gospel and what the church is all about, he gets into chapter 2 and he said, Is all my labor in vain? Understand the 
the emotions in this statement when Paul wrote to the Corinthians and people were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. He never said, is all my labor in vain? When he wrote to the people in Corinthians, when there was immorality in the church, I mean, for Pete's sake, the, the boy was sleeping with his father's wife. Paul did not say, is all my labor in vain? But yet here in the book of Galatians, when Paul arrives on the scene and he realizes that the gospel had been manipulated, that the gospel had taken a back seat, that the truth, the, I mean, the reason that the church existed, when that had taken a back seat in the church, Paul began to say, is all my labor in vain? As he would move on into chapter 3 with this heartache, wondering if all that he had done had been in vain, he began to say to them, who hath bewitched you? Chapter 3. Who, who deceived you? Who tricked you? Who, who brought you to this place where you began to believe that this is the reason why we're here? Who, who brought you to this place? Who bewitched you to believe a false gospel? I begin to wonder even in our churches today, who hath bewitched us to make us believe that when we arrive here, that anything that we do in this hour is about us? This is the overall emphasis of Galatians chapter 6. This hour has nothing to do with us, but by these Judaizers manipulating the gospel and adding works, they had made it of none effect. Let's be reminded that when we show up here, it's not about us, but when we make it about us, we do the same thing. Now, we don't do the same thing in that we manipulate the gospel, but we, we manipulate the power of the gospel in the aspect that we do not preach it with our lives. It sits a backseat in our own lives, in a self-centered society, in a world that was making it all about what they could do, in a world that made it all about what they had to offer. Paul said, not me. Paul said, God forbid that I glory in anything. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. But God forbid that I should glory. I mean, you could stop there, really. Paul said, but God forbid that I should glory in a self-centered society. I mean, you could almost hear the agenda of these Judaizers. Paul, all right, come on, Paul. I mean, you know, I mean, in all the things that you did, are you telling me that there's not one achievement in this past life that you would glory in? I mean, Paul, remember, you was the Pharisee of Pharisees, circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin. He, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a man's man and on top of being a man's man he was granted authority by the Sanhedrin to perform acts on behalf of the Sanhedrin Paul you're telling me in all these things there's not one thing that you could brag about the successes that you had in your life Paul said God forbid that I would ever sit around here and brag about something that I once was the reality in Paul's exclamation in his, in his imperative, this narrative that he's trying to drive home, all of the things that I've done in my past life had no saving effect. I mean, I have been to the cross. He said, I have something to glory about in my life, but I glory about the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Take this as a note for yourself. If you're going to be a part of the difference made in 2024, if you're going to make a difference in your nation, if you're going to make a difference in your community, if you're going to make a difference in your city, if you're going to make a difference in your home, let it be because you gloried in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the only way we're going to make a difference in our world today. We need to get back to people that glories in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ alone. Paul was shouting, shouting to the moon over a cross, though. Understand that. 
Uh, this was not a, uh, the cross was an instrument of death. Hundreds of thousands of people who had died on a cross, but Paul was rejoicing about the person on the cross. There, there was only one cross that Paul wept over. There was only one cross that caused him to preach. There was only one cross that changed his life. There was only one cross, and that was the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, where the sinless, spotless lamb had died on Calvary's hill after bleeding and walking the Via Della Rosa, unable to bear the cross. He walked the Via Della Rosa and there he died. It was, it was that cross. It was the one who was suffered. It was the one who died. It was the one who bled and was crucified for me. Paul said, what do I have the glory in? Saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now also understand when you see what Scripture does say, you need to sit back and stretch your legs about it, what it does not say. It does not say, but God forbid, it says, but God forbid that I should glory save the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, it's not the cross of Buddha. It's not the cross of Muhammad. It's not the cross of Joseph Mormon. It's not the cross of the Pope. It's the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hear me now. Jesus Christ this morning, even in the time that Paul wrote this, he is not in competition with anyone. There is no runner-ups runner this morning. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 9 said, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, all things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice what he says there. Every knee. The Pope's knee. Every knee. The President's knee. Every knee. Putin's knee. Every knee. The Kim Jong-un of the world. Every knee is going to bow to the name of Jesus. There is no runners ups, runner ups in this life. <clears throat> also, Acts chapter 4 and verse number 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's a beautiful name. It's a powerful name. Listen, the Judaizers wanted to remove him as the only way. And by the way, we live in a society today that is still seeking to remove Jesus. Everywhere we turn, they're seeking to remove Jesus. I mean, drive around at Christmas time and look at the billboards. Merry Xmas. I mean, they don't even, they don't want it in Christmas. They don't even want it in the Bible. They don't want it in the courthouse and they definitely don't want it in the schoolhouse. Everywhere we turn, there are people still striving to remove the name of Jesus. And people say today, well, you know what the problem is with your church? You make the way to heaven exclusive. No, no, it is exclusive, but it's also inclusive. The problem is you don't like the way that we present, that the word of God presents as the way to be included. What's the problem? They have a problem with Jesus. In confessing that they, he is, notice what he says, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In confessing that Jesus Christ is the only way. In confessing what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's hill, it is also a confession of his lordship in your life, which means you are now under authority. People don't like that. They don't want to submit to what God says in his word, but even more, the, the saving power in the name of Jesus. So he says, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. He, he told not only the Galatians to look at the person of the cross, but he said, look at the power of it. The world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. He said, listen, you want me to brag about the time that I served in the Sanhedrin? Even in the Sanhedrin, in all my time there, I was still lost in all my way to hell. When I was a Pharisee of Pharisees, I was still lost in all my way to hell. And when I had the authority given to me from the Jewish council, I was still all 
my way to hell. So what is there to brag about? It never was going to get me to heaven. It never brought me even one step closer. God forbid that I should give glory to anything I've ever done. <coughs> God forbid it that I would sit back and brag about the activities that I did and was still lost and on my way to hell. Notice it also what he says, that this cross gave him the power for what? What does the cross give you the power? Yeah, it gives you the power for salvation, but what else does it say? But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. He said, this cross has given me the power to have a separated life. A separated life from the world. The world died to me. Now, does that mean everyone in the world died to him at that moment? No. But what it meant is that the braggadocious spirit that existed in the world, it died to him. It no longer flourished in him. Now all he sees is the cross. Look at verse number 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. He says, it's all dead. Circumcised, uncircumcised. The cross has made a new creature. You understand that, right? Aren't you glad that you don't go to the places you used to go to? Aren't you thankful that you don't behave the way that you used to behave? Aren't you thankful that you're not who you used to be? That now that you're, you're a herald of the cross, that now you're heralding what Christ has done for you? I mean, if you're here and lost this morning, aren't you? Uh, well, first, you need to understand if you're here and lost this morning, understand that you don't need to go to Mecca to find saving faith. You don't need to go down to the confession booth to find saving faith. You don't need to travel to Utah and touch two tablets out in the desert to find saving faith. You need to look to the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Even more, he, he says, for us, for us who are saved this morning, we have to ask ourselves, what have we been bragging about this past week? I mean, what are you proud of this morning? What was you proud of yesterday? When is the last time we're forced to ask ourselves, when is the last time we bragged about the cross? <laughs> When's the last time our Facebook account seen a message about the cross? When's the last time our Twitter account seen a message about the cross and uh, Instagram seen a message about the cross? When is the last time our co-workers heard us brag on the cross? When is the last time we was at school and people got to acting foolish and we started bragging about the cross of Jesus Christ? You may be thinking, Pastor, come on. But that's exactly what verse 16 says. Verse 16 says, you get a new perspective in life after you see the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But look at verse 15 first. As many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Why does he say that? Because the Judaizers were trying to insert their own rules. The Judaizers was trying to come up with their own way. He said, but to those or as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them. You know, the world is looking for peace. They want peace. Matter of fact, we're tragically made aware, it seems on the daily, that people are taking their own lives because they are unable to find peace. But what is offered here for us is the peace of God. He said, as many walk according to this road, peace be on them and mercy. And then notice what he says here. And upon the Israel of God. Upon the Israel of God. Now, notice what he's doing to them. Remember, Paul was a missionary to the Gentiles. But what Paul is saying here, remember when the, when the Judaizers realized that these Gentiles was worshiping the God of Israel, worshiping the one true God. They sought to bring them into their fold. They sought to make them Judaizers. But what Paul is saying, listen, 
for those who walk according to this rule, meaning for anyone who has repented of their sins and placed their faith in Jesus Christ, you are now the Israel of God. This is, doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or not, a Jew or Gentile, red, white, or candy stripe. You repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus. You are now considered the Israel of God. And lastly, he says here, we get a new perspective. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Can you hear his frustration? Can you hear the frustration that he lifts up here? From henceforth, let no man trouble me. From here on out, don't bother me no more with this. From here on out, you can just go ahead and don't even, don't even bother me with the situation altogether. Paul is sick of people who claim to have Jesus. Don't miss it. He's sick of people who claim to have Jesus in their life and are still acting like the old man before they came to the cross. That's the problem. He said, wait a minute. You said you've been to the cross. Yeah. You said you repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus. Yes. Why are you still acting like you need circumcision? Listen, it is troublesome today that there are people who claim that they've been to the cross and are still acting like the old man. It's troublesome that people who have claimed to be been to the cross and are still living a life of sin to hear that they're still exercising in their life the old man. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, he said, makes new creatures, new creatures. Me and my wife, as we drove down to this Christian workers conference, I had a reflective moment in my life. And I looked over and asked her, what are we doing? Of course, it wasn't a moment of amnesia, but I was serious. What are we doing? I mean, who would have ever thought that 18 and a half years ago that, that God would, when he was working, that he would show up on the scene in my life, a no good scoundrel dealing drugs and living in this world, that God would show up on the scene and so work in my life that we would be on our way to encourage other people not to give up on Jesus. A new perspective, a new hope, a new thought. It was not who I was, but it is who I am today because of the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's changed who I am today, and it's changed my wife. I thank God for what he's done, but it gave me a, a new perspective. He said, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. In Galatia, during this time, it was nothing to walk around the areas of Asia Minor and to see people who had branded themselves. Oftentimes, the branding would take place. They would brand themselves in the forehead. They would mark their bodies. And by looking upon those people, you could see the God who they worshipped, the false God who they worshipped. You could see who they were following after. Paul says here, he said that he bore in his body, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Now, though I don't mean, believe that he was alluding to this, I believe that this is also, I love how he says, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. For those who are saved, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In my body, I bear in my body the marks of that I have repented of my sins and placed my faith in Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit dwells in me. But I'm also reminded of what he said in just a few verses earlier. In verse number 12, he says, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, lest they only should what? Suffer persecution. For what? For the cross of Christ. 
Meaning this was a time of great conflict. It was to either go with them or to face persecution. It was to go with them or suffer the repercussions of not following after them. Paul said, listen, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. I bear some marks in my own life. Listen, Paul would even go on to say that he didn't view these Judaizers much difference from them. You guys are trying to say, oh, we're circumcised and this is our mark and they bear their mark and this is how you prove how. He said, I bear marks in my body of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, don't trouble me no more. I have been beaten for the cross of Jesus Christ. I have been shipwrecked for the cross of Jesus Christ. I have been forsaken by friends for the cross of Jesus Christ. I have, I have some marks too. And he says, and, I, and I'm not bragging, but I have been given some marks for preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you read verses 10 and 11 and 12 and 13, you are reminded of what he's saying because he's saying, listen, if you would get serious about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to bear some marks too. And those marks that you're bearing will probably come at the hand of the same Judaizers who's drawn you away. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. But also notice what he says in closing. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Paul does not say, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus and the law of our God. He says, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. He doesn't say the circumcision. He doesn't say the uncircumcision. Just the grace of our Lord. Salvation is by grace. By grace are ye saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So how about it? What are we glorying most today? What have we been glorying in today? There is nothing more divisive in a church. When people arrive in the church seeking to magnify themselves instead of magnifying the cross of Jesus Christ. I mean, we were going through unity in Sunday school, and this morning we was talking about the metaphor that Paul gives in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 about the body being the example, the metaphor giving as the body of Christ. We are one, one body, one body. Could you imagine... In this metaphor, if Paul would have said that the hand was arguing with the foot, I mean, how would, I mean, listen, when, when the hand stop, when your hand stops working, we recognize that something's wrong, right? Something is dysfunctional in the body. When we arrive here and magnify anything else but the cross of Jesus Christ, we are seeking a service of disunity instead of unity. Paul said, when I look at everything that's happened in my life, when I look at all of my accomplishments, when I look at the things that I've done prior to say salvation, they mean nothing to me because he always had his eyes on home. He always had his eyes on heaven. Therefore, he had a heart and a speech that always sought to magnify the cross of Jesus Christ because it was the person of the cross that gave him the power to separate from the old man and also established a new perspective in his life. That's the cross. That's what the cross does. It has the power to suppress the old man and set a new path for the new man. Let's not forget that. After yesterday, my heart hurt. And I thought at times like, well, this is an issue and that is an issue. But there are churches out there right now today in serious warfare. It started off good. The one brother told me and my wife, as he told us, he said, it was so good. 
The Lord was moving. There was blessing. Souls were being saved. This was happening. That was happening. And now guess what? This is happening. People are leaving and 13's going here and now they're going to another church. Listen, if we are not careful and keep the main thing, the main thing, as the Lord blesses this church, the same thing will happen to us. The cross, that is the church's message. That is the reason we're all here. The cross, the cross. It's all about the cross. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, Lord, we give thanks to you for all that you've done for us in our lives. Lord, forbid us from ever glorying in anything else except the cross of your Son that's changed us and made us anew. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. We glory in your name. We magnify your name, Lord. May we be people who make much of you. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.